Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Harvey Center's public lecture titled Security Community Building in ASEAN, A Never-Ending Story. My name is Mabda. I'm a researcher at the Harvey Center, and I will be moderating today's public lecture with Dr. Stephanie Martel. Dr. Stephanie Martel is an assistant professor of political studies specializing in international relations and also the director of the Center for International and Defense Policy at Queen's University. She is also a distinguished fellow at the Asia Pacific Foundation of Canada and director of the Network for Strategic Analysis. So thank you, Doctor, for visiting our center and for agreeing and taking the time to prepare such um, an interesting topic for our today uh, lecture. Um, and also today's lecture will primarily be based on Dr. Martel's newest book titled uh, Enacting the Security Community, ASEAN's Never Ending Story, which was published last year. Uh, with Stanford University Press, which really unpacks what security community means in ASEAN and problematizes the way security community is understood uh, within the discipline, not only within IR, but also within the discussion of Southeast Asia as a region in general. So um, for today's discussion, we will hear from Dr. Marchal on her book, as well as her findings and her reflections on recent developments as well in the region. And we will proceed into sections. The first one is a 30 minutes remark by uh, Dr. Marshall, and we will proceed with um, a Q&A session afterwards. And of course, par uh, participants uh, who are uh, watching the lecture in person will also have the opportunity to raise questions as well as those watching online. So please feel free to leave uh, comments on the chat box feature on YouTube if uh, you have questions you would like to ask. So, um, without further ado, I would like to pass the microphone to uh, Dr. Marshall to start her presentation. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you so much, uh, and thank you so much for the invitation. It's actually, I'm, I'm very embarrassed to say that it is the first time that I'm visiting the Habibi Center. I've met with a few researchers from the center uh, over the years. Uh, the last time I was in Jakarta was so long ago. It was 2015 already. Of, well, of course, the pandemic didn't help with that. Uh, but I'm, I'm really glad to not only be back, but also have the chance to visit uh, this wonderful center and learn more about uh, it's the excellent research that is being conducted here, uh, including on topics that very much align with my, my own research agenda. Um, so um, my remarks today, uh, as mentioned, will uh, draw primarily from uh, my recently published book, enacting this, the, the security community, ASEAN's never-ending story. Uh, what I hope to do is that uh, basically to set the stage with uh, some reflections on ASEAN's journey so far when it comes to its path um, towards becoming a security community. Uh, and then uh, hopefully this, this will lead to, and I'm sure actually that it will, but to, to productive discussions afterwards on, on where it might be going, right? Um, so, on the one hand, on the one hand, um, it's it's always it, it's always a pleasure, but also a challenge to speak to an audience such as the one in this room uh, and also online. So, on the one hand, um, I save a lot of speaking time just not having to go through an ASEAN 101 crash course uh, for people to understand what I will be talking about. I don't need to do this here. I often have to uh, in Canada, but it's very, uh, it's a fortunate thing that I don't have to um, this time so I can focus on the core of the matter and the substance. Uh, on the other hand, it's also a challenge to speak to people who are um, so daily immersed in the, the subject matter that I study most of the time from afar, right? So it, it makes things a little challenging, even intimidating. So I, I don't know that I, you will learn a lot from me today, actually. Uh, but I would, what I hope to offer is to be able to um, suggest maybe a different perspective on some of the things that you're very familiar with. Uh, and hopefully this can lead to, uh, again, a, a nice discussion afterwards. And I would be very much looking forward to, to feedback. So this book is obviously about ASEAN. Um, it's about its security community building project uh, in particular. And of course, um, a lot has been written on this topic already. Um, but what I propose here is to 
look at ASEAN security community building process through a different angle than the one that we've been mostly exposed um, to. And the starting point is that if ASEAN is in fact a talk shop, which many seem to suggest that it is, then we need to take this fact much more seriously and we need to better understand its effects. Importantly, um, I do not need to simply reiterate what has become, I think many will agree, a bit of a cliche about ASEAN. And you will all be familiar with this, uh, I'm sure, but you know, talking is better than fighting, um, dialogue and process matter. And of course I agree with this, to be very clear. But what I l look to do in this book is to, to borrow from ASEAN parlance to take this to a higher plane. And I think that we're, you know, there are several reasons why we should actually care a lot about uh, how people who are involved on a daily basis in ASEAN security governance talk and write about security and about security community. And there are several reasons for that. The first one is that we cannot really make sense of the world around us and of world politics in particular without language. Right? We need words to process world politics and social reality just in general. And we, can certainly can, we, we certainly cannot make collective sense of what it means to build a security community without words that we use to describe this endeavor. Right? And so instead of offering an assessment, which many have done, on whether uh, or not ASEAN is or isn't a security community um, according to some academic definition of the term or uh, to try to predict whether ASEAN will ever become a fully fledged or genuine security community. What I do in this book is I start with the meaning that people who are actually invested in this project give to the project and to this enterprise. And what they have to say about it and to what effect. And so to clarify, um, and this will become you know, important to remember as I unpack a little bit more of the, of the findings of the book, whether people actually believe what they say is not really what's at stake here with this research. Um, because saying it, saying something actually has effects irrespective of whether people believe what they say or not. And I, I'm not saying that they don't. I'm just saying I just don't go there. So another reason uh, why we need to pay more attention to language and discourse when it comes to thinking about uh, ASEAN as a, as a security community, whether we agree that it's one already or whether it's, a, it's still a, a, an, an aspiration, is that ASEAN itself has come to realize that discourse is power quite explicitly. So first on December 31st, 2015, ASEAN formally established uh, its community while at the very same time acknowledging that actually it wasn't quite one yet, um, but also that it didn't really matter, right? And then in August 2020, as I was writing this book, ASEAN held a consultation whose explicitly stated objective was to provide a narrative on ASEAN's identity. And that consultation was meant to address a set of key questions. Who are we? What do we stand for? And what does ASEAN mean? Those were the questions that the ASEAN Secretary General raised in 2020 for this consultation. And so the fact that ASEAN could declare itself a security community without having answers to these questions is not a sign of failure, or not just that at least, but it's a testament to the power of discourse and language. So to be blunt, if you repeat something enough time, people will start believing it. Right? We know this kind of intuitively. And yet only a few years ago, whenever people would um, talk about the role of language and discourse in bringing the security community about, 
it, it was mostly to complain about a gap between rhetoric and practice, right? And that was it. You've heard this already uh, many times, I'm sure. Besides a few postmodernists on the margins of uh, the IR discipline, no one cared about discourse much, right? Some of you who are well versed in IR theory might say, oh, but the constructivists cared, right? This is all they care about. Um, I would argue that they cared more about what discourse is hiding, beliefs, values, norms, what hides, what hides behind the language that we use. The rationalists or the realists would say, oh, it's motives and interests that hide behind the language that we use to describe things. Um, but neither of them, of them were really interested in discourse and language in and of itself and what it does. Now you cannot go through the day without some pundit, but also policymakers and even military people talking about how a battle of narratives is unfolding on the international stage, or the need to come up with a convincing narrative of our foreign policy and defense. You've heard this, I'm sure, uh, before. And such considerations were certainly on full display at the Shangri-La Dialogue in Singapore uh, this past weekend. So I wish this meant I would be making a lot of money with this book. I don't think this is what's going to happen. Uh, but I will instead humbly suggest that uh, maybe this book comes at the right time. And a final reason why we should be paying much more attention, I think, to language and discourse in this story is that ASEAN does not have a monopoly on the talk shop label. It might arguably be especially good at it, um, but this is a critique that is often waged at diplomacy, at international organizations, uh, and various multilateral dialogues across the world, including those with much more material resources. So if we are actually serious about wanting to understand how multilateralism actually works in practice, we need to pay more attention to the power of words. <clears throat> The argument that I make in this book is that ASEAN security community is first and foremost a product of language and discourse. Discourse is how the security community reproduces itself over time, despite the fact that it can never actually reach its endpoints. I refer to this as the never-ending story of ASEAN security community. And it does so through people who are invested in making ASEAN security community a reality. And what I argue more specifically is that they do so by channeling not one, but at least three different versions of the security community. And these versions, these versions are not easily reconciled. They are not only distinct, but they're also, they are also rooted in incompatible views of what both security and community mean in the context of ASEAN. And paradoxically, what I refer to in the book as polysemy, the fact that the ASEAN security community has several different meanings, is actually not a flaw on the part of the, the organization. It's not a problem of coherence. There is a design to it, because this is precisely what allows ASEAN to continue to attract continuous support to its project from a broad variety of stakeholders who actually do not agree on what it means to have security or to have community. And so this uh, allows ASEAN to basically carry on with this project despite the fact that it continues to fail to deliver on its promises. And this is what makes it a never-ending story. In my view, it's a very important story nonetheless. It's one that we should absolutely pay attention to instead of just dismiss as insignificant or meaningless because there is a lack of, a, a lack of practical results or a lack of actually uh, the ability of ASEAN to meet its aspirations. I want to say at this point that um, 
the argument that I make is not that discourse and language are all powerful, right? Obviously, material factors matter quite a lot. Um, what I want to stress is that it's an important part of ASEAN's story that deserves more attention and hasn't been paid the attention that it deserves. Um, I won't bore you with uh, a discussion of theory. I'm just going to open a quick parenthesis, just in case there are people in the room or listening online who are interested in these things and would, would look forward to perhaps reading the book to know more. Um, and I'm also happy to address any questions uh, during the Q&A about this. Um, I just want to flag that I, I use a variety of um, theoretical and methodological tools uh, in the book. I draw from uh, narrative scholarship in international relations, discourse analysis, but also practice theory, uh, literature on ontological security, uh, critical security studies. So I'm just flagging that to your attention. I won't bore you with the details, uh, but I'm, I'm obviously happy to have a side chat about any, uh, about any of it later or, or during the Q&A. So to go back to the, the core of the argument, um, that the ASEAN security community has different meanings sets it on different paths towards the realization of its security community. And these paths are pursued simultaneously. And the empirical chapters of the book uh, actually reconstruct these uh, various paths. And I'm going to unpack them for you a little bit just to give you an overview um, today. And what's interesting is that um, basically the, the, the empirical chapters reconstruct how ASEAN launched itself on these different paths um, and how they overlap but also conflict with one another. And I refer to these as different versions, basically, of the security community. Um, and these versions are rooted in, in distinct stories about ASEAN's role in bringing um, the security community into being. So again, happy to get into the specifics and answer any, any specific questions you might have. Um, but before uh, I start unpacking the stories a little bit, I just want to ask you to remember that to be compelling, a story needs to be anchored in truth, right? Um, and so what I suggest by calling these stories is not to say that they're false, right? They are all rooted in some at least partial understanding of, of, uh, of the truth. What's interesting, though, is that um, these stories are all uh, at least partly grounded in truth, but they're also, to a, 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 a significant extent, incompatible. Because this, this is where things start to, to, to become interesting. Um, and what I do is that instead of me providing myself an assessment on which story is the truer or you know, trying to make an assessment um, on that front, what I do is that instead of doing that, I take a step back and I channel other people uh, and who are involved in the project of making ASEAN's uh, security community brought into reality what they think about them. So the first version that I want to unpack with you uh, of ASEAN's story as a security community, I refer to as the non-traditional security community. And its starting point is the view that ASEAN and the region is first and foremost impacted by non-traditional security threats, which, as you very well know, um, is a broad, but some would say even ill-defined category um, of issues that encompasses many different things, um, but that are typically non-military or transnational challenges to security. And typically, this particular story will invoke a number of what I refer to in the book as boogeymen, um, pirates, criminals, terrorists. And these boogeymen uh, operate in in-between spaces, outside the gaze of the state. And they're typically presented as out to get ASEAN. They can also never be totally eradicated. But that doesn't prevent ASEAN from trying, right? And we can see a number of uh, objectives of ASEAN being defined this way as a way to eradicate the boogeyman. We can just think about ASEAN's uh, objective to become drug-free, for instance, as a good example of this. 
And what will happen is that uh, ASEAN and the champions of this particular version of the security community will present the security community as the solution that will allow ASEAN to do so, to eradicate the boogeyman. And so the book goes into a fair bit of detail. Uh, it shows how ASEAN got to define its security role this way uh, through a focus first on drug trafficking, then uh, leading to uh, a focus on transnational crime more broadly, and then finally embracing the label of non-traditional security, which allows to expand beyond just transnational crime, although transnational crime remains very much the, the core of this, um, this category of issues. Um, but I, the, the book also looks into tensions and contradictions that accompany the retelling of this story. Um, and there are a number of actors who are involved in, in the creation of ASEAN security community who are going to themselves challenge this story for very, very different reasons. So some of them will say, you know, um, non-traditional security and this focus that ASEAN puts on this is, is a pretext, right? It's to avoid addressing real hard security issues. Um, some will say also, you know, it, 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 it's problematic because it presupposes this kind of alignment between state security and people's security, uh, which is in fact not at all the case. Uh, some will also stress that uh, what's presented as new or non-traditional is actually very old and quite traditional from a Southeast Asian perspective when it comes to thinking about national security. And I'm sure many of you have heard these arguments before, right, that they're not new to you. Uh, and maybe you've even, even raised these arguments yourself. The second version uh, of the security community that I refer to in the book is that I call it a traditional one. And I call it this way because uh, basically the idea is that um, we're faced with a back to the future scenario where the region, first and foremost, uh, ought to worry about a return to interstate conflict, possibly war, and the focus here, of course, is on flashpoints like the South China Sea uh, or elsewhere, but also broader patterns of major power rivalry. And here, ASEAN is basically presented as a David-facing giants, dragons, more specifically, we follow the book's uh, metaphor. But this is a story that presents ASEAN as this sort of hero, I would even say anti-hero to some extent, because ASEAN is deemed to not have the typical characteristics of a heroic actor. Uh, there's a lot of focus on ASEAN's strength and weakness, et cetera, the fact that it's, a, it's not as threatening uh, as it would be if it was a major power, et cetera. So these qualities allow ASEAN to position itself as, again, the solution, right? Um, and ASEAN will be presented as, you know, this actor tirelessly pushing for the only reasonable course of action in the face of uh, major power rivalry. And this narrative will also justify more specific initiatives, like a code of conduct on the South China Sea, or uh, the promotion of ASEAN centrality in the broader uh, regional security architecture, especially against uh, attempts to push for non-ASEAN-centric alternatives. Um, and so here the book uh, situates uh, recent debates around the Quad uh, and the free and open and now inclusive Indo-Pacific against the backdrop of previous moments in that story. Um, and in a very familiar scenario for those of you uh, and us who are paying attention, it's a scenario that's very familiar in which ASEAN, every time its role is questioned, is always able to reassert itself as the only possible vehicle for peace between states in the Asia come Indo-Pacific. One in which all of its dialogue partners, perhaps reluctantly, have no other choice in the end but to agree that if ASEAN didn't exist, it would need to be invented. And that it ought to therefore be strengthened, right? So again, lip service is an issue. We see a lot of commitments to ASEAN centrality that are not necessarily followed through. 
um, absolutely, this is this is this is an issue, and it's definitely part of the story. But at the same time, ASEAN's discursive power, despite the fact that it's not without challenge, is nonetheless pretty impressive. Because you get to a point where every time you're back to a commitment to reinforcing existing institutions that are ASEAN-led or ASEAN-centric. And if I had to guess, this is pretty much what we're seeing right now with the way that the Quad is being kind of um, gradually adapted or shifted or described in different ways now that it had been just only a, a, year, a year or so ago, right? And interestingly, so this version also connects very well with non-traditional security. So I don't mean to suggest that uh, non-traditional security was actually just discussed as part of the first version. Non-traditional security actually features very importantly in that story, but in a very different way. Here it's going to be presented as, you know, these low-hanging fruits, these soft issues that, you know, can help build trust, at, the, at, the, at best can help build trust and confidence, and at worst are just a pretext for um, having side conversations outside the meeting room, you know, around uh, lunch or, or other activities, right? And finally, the third version of the security community, uh, I call a people-centered one. We could call it people-driven or people-oriented. I'll let you uh, choose your preferred label here. Um, but this is the version that is the closest to a regional version of human security or the responsibility to protect, although these uh, in, in the ASEAN context, and obviously depending on the country we're talking about, uh, remain understandably controversial. But here I discuss uh, a broad variety of issues that sometimes, again, cross over with non-traditional security. Non-traditional security is everywhere in this story. Um, but are less focused on fighting boogeymen through security and defense forces this time, but are more focused on providing security to the people on an everyday basis against uh, pandemics, disasters, uh, and more recently through a regional women, peace, and security agenda. And here the story is actively contested also by, uh, mostly by a, a regional network of peace and security activists who have come to uh, be uh, quite uh, efficient at calling out ASEAN for failing to uphold its aspirations to form a security community in practice. So these actors will invoke the fact that ASEAN has embraced the goal of becoming a security community to say, well, you're not meeting your aspirations because a security community is supposed to mean this and that and this thing. And you're not actually meeting your, your promises. And so what I do here is I track the ability of various actors who name and shame ASEAN to use various discursive uh, practices that contribute to shaping its approach to security, even if there's no clear norm or no instance of clear normative change happening, that there is still an impact in the way that ASEAN itself comes to define its approach to move forward. And this impact is actually visible uh, at least when it comes to policy design. I don't want to stress too much the implementation part uh, for reasons that you, you can imagine, I'm sure. Uh, but here the book covers issues like peacekeeping, trafficking in persons, the Rohingya crisis, and while most of the manuscript was actually completed before the coup in Myanmar, it situates also the current conflict against the backdrop of a broader, long-standing Myanmar problem uh, for, for ASEAN um, that sees the ASEAN's approach evolve, even as many would say, you know, deservedly so, that it's not enough. But it's still, there are some changes that result uh, uh, through these, these encounters with uh, critiques of the organization. And so in conclusion, none of the, the, the stories that I describe about ASEAN security community are entirely fictional. Again, my approach is not about parsing out what's true from what's false and which version is the most accurate representation of the region's uh, security reality. I expect that even in this very room, there might be some stories that some people will find more compelling than others. Uh, and I, I expect that 
you might disagree with each other on this. So that's also, I think, um, uh, an advantage, if, I, if, I, if I, I can suggest that, of the book is that it moves us beyond uh, a, a, the usual state-centric focus where um, we will say typically that it's a matter of different security preferences on the part of, of ASEAN member states. There's more to it than that, because even people within a particular uh, member state government or, you know, uh, even a, 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 a research institute like the Habibi Center might have some different uh, understandings of what it means to build a security community in ASEAN. So what I wanted to do with this book is to trace that complexity and the fact that there are some, a, a great deal of variation in how people think about this particular objective even within uh, particular member states. And so <clears throat> the other thing I want to stress at this point is also that all of these stories about ASEAN are prevalent, but their, sa their salience is going to ebb and flow from time to time, obviously depending on what the issue of the day is. Um, but they are all interestingly contested and challenged from within. At the same time, it's not like people need to just pick one story. Right? A number of people, including many of the people I've interviewed for this project, will channel different versions of the security community even within a particular conversation. They will shift from one to the other. It's not, and that's not a fault, right? That's not a mistake to do so, absolutely not. It just speaks to how elusive the goal of being secure is. Questions about the future of ASEAN, whether it will be able to survive the latest crisis, et cetera, et cetera, have been a recurring topic of discussion. One could say going back to the very inception of ASEAN, really. So despite its many limitations, which people spend a lot of time complaining about and are very well documented already, ASEAN has proven to be a very resilient institution. It continues to escape predictions of its death foretold. It is taking on more and more issues, including security ones, as part of an ever-growing agenda. It continues to foster expressions of support and support to its centrality in particular, leading much more powerful others to adjust to its own views of how regional security and order ought to be pursued. And we see this happening quite clearly around the Quad and the Indo-Pacific. And current debates on uh, the rules-based order, including this weekend in Singapore, certainly reflect this. Even ASEAN's most fervent critics ultimately agree that the world would be a better place if ASEAN could only realize its stated aspirations. So for an organization with as few human and material resources, this is quite extraordinary. And I hope I've been able to convince you that it cannot make sense unless we take the power of discourse seriously. Thank you very much. I look forward to your question. Okay. Um, thank you, Dr. Marla, for the presentation. I think um, reading the book itself, uh, I find it really interesting because it really fills a clear gap in the literature in the sense that it really fills the void of a lack of critical view um, on ASEAN in general, given that I think a lot of scholars have pointed out that literature on ASEAN is uh, still very much dominated by those um, referring to um, realist or constructivism um, in their theoretical framework. So I think it's interesting how you uh, take a very different approach from uh, what we are seeing in most of the literature available today. But also you add an alternative view uh, to uh, not only uh, the way to see ASEAN from how it is practiced, but also just really problematizing itself, uh, ASEAN uh, from really problematizing what, is, what seems to be business per usual in ASEAN in the sense that you're really unpacking how even though a lot of criticism is levied against ASEAN for being uh, merely a talk shop, but really try to unpack uh, the different ways that security is invoked uh, within the different platforms available um, in the region. 
And in that sense, I think it allows us to really think of our ways of con uh, conceiving ASEAN as uh, in in institution, but also in thinking about uh, the sort of criticism that we've seen today uh, towards, uh, directed towards ASEAN, uh, given that I think, especially this year, uh, seeing how it is from, the, from Indonesia, we're seeing a lot of criticism uh, directed to ASEAN for its lack of practical results, for its lack of ability to really address um, regional uh, issues. So in that sense, I think it allows us to rethink and appreciate ASEAN as um, a security community from uh, a completely different lens than what we are probably used to if you're following Southeast Asian um, IR literature. So um, I found the book really interesting. I would really like recommend everyone reading the book. But um, I think it's, of course, time for um, a short q &A. But before we proceed with the q &A, so everyone, um, uh, we're happy to take uh, questions. But I would just like to ask um, one question on Myanmar. I understand that um, you mentioned Myanmar uh, quite a lot in your book. You have a dedicated section on uh, Rohingya as well. But I think what I find interesting about the way the crisis has transpired in the last two years, especially after the coup, is that it sort of really highlights the fact that the three stories that you mentioned in your book is really poised and cannot be seen as rigid, um, different sense of securities. And in that sense, I think um, it really shows that um, security cannot be understood um, in a very rigid sense, in the sense that traditional security is completely different from non-traditional security because what the Myanmar crisis shows us is that the way security is invoked can transcend different sense, these different discourses on security. So my question is that how would you juxtapose the way the crisis has unfolded in the last two years, especially uh, after the coup and with your findings from the book? That's an excellent and challenging question. Um, I would say that I think you can look at the, this particular crisis from different angles, right? And I think depending on which stakeholder or actor you look at, the prism through which they see the crisis is going to look different. And this probably can be <clears throat> tied to the three versions over there, right? I very much doubt that there is any consideration from this junta on the security of the people in Myanmar. I don't think we can say that. Um, and I think in this sense, this is what is becoming extremely tricky for ASEAN as the kind of go-to actor to supposedly be able to manage that crisis in a way that others cannot, is to deal with this particular junta and the fact that they are absolutely not responsive to any sort of social pressure, which is the, the, the kind of pressure that ASEAN has been able to, up until now, exercise on Myanmar. And some people would say it has, been, it has not been very effective at doing so. You know, we, we can debate that. Um, but we can probably at least see that in previous moments, around this Myanmar problem that is, as I mentioned earlier, and as you well know, is a recurring problem for ASEAN since we can date this back to, to Myanmar joining the organization, but even before that. Um, this particular moment in the Myanmar, in a in, in long-standing Myanmar crisis for ASEAN is, is different. And this complicates the, the ability of ASEAN to do anything on that, on that particular crisis. So I, I'm not here to, I mean, <clears throat> there are a few um, practical solutions in terms of uh, the, the various uh, ways to engage a broad variety of stakeholders. Uh, we know that Indonesia is, is taking, uh, which, is, which very much aligns with past practice in ASEAN, a quiet diplomacy approach. So I'm, I, was, I was actually uh, a bit surprised to, uh, l to learn coming here that even Indonesians do not necessarily know all that much about what's going on and are asking themselves the same questions <laughs> as I'm asking myself. So um, I think it's easy to blame ASEAN for not being able to do more on, on Myanmar, uh, but I don't think, and, and I think there is some truth to the argument that 
there's not much that anybody, any international organization, even with far more resources than ASEAN, could actually do um, in this crisis uh, beyond what it is trying to do, just because this junta is particularly unresponsive. So to go back to the initial question, I think the junta would look at the crisis as something about, you know, oh, it's, uh, you know, the state personified by the military has to control, you know, its territory. Um, and so that's kind of a very pr traditional, you know, outlook on, on security. Um, I don't know that they would, perhaps, I, I, I haven't, maybe there is a link to, and that's part of the, the argumentation uh, that, you know, non-traditional security is part of that story. I don't, I don't necessarily see that link all that well. Um, so yes, in the book, typically the Myanmar crisis, from the perspective of ASEAN, would be treated as kind of this people-centric uh, focus of the security community. Um, but again, depending on the stakeholders, so clearly the military doesn't see it like that, right? So, so again, it's about how you can take a particular crisis, look at it from various perspectives, and basically, you know, the same question uh, comes back, right? Security for whom? Is it security for the military? Is it security for the people of Myanmar? And you're going to get very different uh, uh, policy solutions that will be justified depending on whose security it is that you have in mind, right? Or is it the security of ASEAN itself and its credibility as an organization? I think that's also part of the story. Sometimes it seems like ASEAN's credibility comes first. Right? So the need for ASEAN to be a unified, uh, to speak with one voice, to the, for its credibility not to be threatened, that seems sometimes to trump the concerns about the people of Myanmar and their security, right? And I don't think that should necessarily be the case, although I understand that this is a very tricky situation for ASEAN. Yeah, I hope that answers your question. Great. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think it's also interesting how you sort of unpack these different issues uh, through different stories, because sometimes you also go back to different stories to highlight that sometimes one case can be viewed from different lenses as well, because sometimes an issue is not necessarily a traditional security only, but it, it can also be regarded as a non-traditional security. For example, you mentioned South China Sea and how Indonesia, uh, ASEAN in general sort of approach the issue from a softer, non-traditional nuance and transforming into a much more harder stance by really tra tackling the um, issue in a much uh, more um, critical way. So I think that's really one of the values of the book and really trying to problematize the way we see ASEAN and the demand for ASEAN to really perform practically. Um, the, the South China Sea issue is actually a perfect example of this. Um, and that's part of the, the it's, it, it's a bit paradoxical because I'm fully aware that having to divide these issues into chapters and with these versions, it creates a sense of rigidity as if there wasn't a lot that's of overlap. Yeah. And so as I was developing this, this book, the constant challenge was, oh, where does that particular issue fit? Because it could fit in all of these things, right? And the South China Sea was actually the perfect example to describe that. Because if you, you can look at it from a very traditional prism, right? So it's tensions between states around control over territory. There's not much more than that when it comes to traditional security. Like there, you cannot think about any of it that would be more traditional security than that. Um, ASEAN's approach has been to focus on the non-traditional kind of elements as a way to Hopefully, you know, you start with the low-hanging fruit, so you start with, you know, humanitarian disaster, search and rescue, um, you know, uh, piracy, you know, and so that's, that's very, that aligns very clearly with ASEAN's typical focus on, on non-traditional security as a way to deal with some more consensual, you know, issues that, that, that ha have to do with security in the South China Sea. And then finally, if you, if you take the kind of people-centric focus, then you're going to put much more emphasis on the preservation of fish stocks, food security, um, the security of fishermen who, are, who come into, you know, encounters uh, with, with Chinese uh, vessels. And so you're going to have this very kind of even almost human security outlook on the South China Sea. So you could actually see uh, that particular issue from all these, perspectives. All right. And so I ended up treating the South China Sea 
as part of my discussion of the traditional security because I think that's the most kind of predominant way of looking at this issue in the case of ASEAN, but it has ramifications from the, the other versions as well that are, that are quite visible. Great. Thank you. And I think that sets up mostly for question and answer session. So is there any question from the audience? Professor Anwar, please. Thank you very much. Uh, I really enjoyed listening to that. I haven't read the book, uh, so I'm really looking forward to, you know, to having uh, the, the book gifted <laughs> by you to the Habibi Center, probably. Uh, but uh, firstly, I, I, I really like, you know, the idea, the emphasis. Uh, discourse is important. Uh, what I see is that you're making ASEAN sounds much more sophisticated <laughs> than what, you know, uh, it's organic development of ASEAN. You know, no, I doubt very much that the policy makers of ASEAN think of it, you know, in this, in this very complicated way. Uh, so uh, it's good that an outside academic, you know, can have a clear-eyed vision. Uh, Mabda talk about realism and constructivism. I'm not sure where you locate yourself between the realists, the liberals, and constructivists, but I think you're, you're using all kind of tools, right, uh, uh, in this. But the emphasis that the discourse do matters. Maybe you're closer to the constructivists in this sense. But what I find intriguing is what, what is already being taken for granted in terms of security community. Because when Karl Deutsch wrote about security community, he talked about how to prevent states from fighting wars against each other by developing functional linkages and so on. And, and for that sense, you know, like in the European Union, how a security community is when states have such complex interdependence with each other that wars between them will be inconceivable. When we look at your chapters, the relations between ASEAN states are taken for granted that war is no longer conceivable. In that sense, the ASEAN project is already well established in that sense. Because it, as in that sense, you know, international relations among Southeast Asian nations within ASEAN has already developed into a full-fledged community because you didn't even consider that. When you're talking about the, you know, traditional security threats, it's there are the dragons and the eagles. And, and whatever, the bears, you know. Uh, but you, there's no more concerns about Indonesia going in the confrontations against Malaysia or Thailand going in a war against Cambodia. You have already taken that for granted. So that's very interesting. Is that really the case? You know, in that case, the ASEAN project, which was really internal in initially to, to develop good neighborly relations, is finished. The security community is here uh, in that in that traditional Deutschen sense. Secondly, um, within the ASEAN context, Indonesia introduced, you know, first the ASEAN security community, but expanded it to ASEAN political security community because there is this a sense of distinction that ASEAN security community tends to be much more interstate, while the political security community is the one that you're talking about, about the, the internal nature, that not just peace between states, but peace within states. So that should be more human-centric. Uh, I don't know whether you mentioned, you know, why, why, why that, that it's not an ASEAN security community pillar, but an ASEAN political security community pillar. You know, I don't know whether you mentioned that in your, in your book. But lastly, I'm intrigued by the title. Uh, I really enjoy that, you know, that title. But the one with the people-centered one is referring to sirens. Now, sirens, as you know, are attractive ladies who call sailors to their doom. Uh, by, by referring to the call of sirens of people centered on, are you saying that ASEAN is in danger of being thrashed to the rocks by the sirens of people centered security? Why, why that choice of word? Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I'm very glad to have your feedback. Uh, and so I'll start with the last question. And that's going to help me clarify what I do in this book. 
which is to really start and focus on what people in ASEAN say about the security community. Because there's been so much discussion about whether or not ASEAN meets the definition, either by Carl Dodge or by, you know, Adler uh, and Barnett, or even to some extent by Amitav Acharya, whether or not ASEAN meets the standards that are coming out of academic literature. And I wanted to do something different. I wanted to start from how people who have been uh, developing the, the ASEAN-specific project for the organization to become a security community think about what it means to have that community. And so you're right. Uh, it is being, I think, taken for granted that there is there hasn't been or there, there, there will no longer be conflict between the member states of ASEAN. Um, this is very much part of the story that ASEAN tells about itself, right? That we have that already. So then we can move to address more and more and more when it comes to developing the organization into a security community. So part of what makes it a complicated story is the aspirations that ASEAN sets for itself, right, in doing so much more than just the absence of war between states. Although I think we can all agree there are still tensions, right? So I don't know that the risk of conflict, at least maybe below the threshold of war, has been completely eliminated. Um, but yeah, I think it's safe to say that ASEAN is, is seeking to move to a definition of what it means to have peace and to have security that's um, more aligned with the 21st century, perhaps, and, and reflects the variety of um, security issues that are now on its agenda. And its agenda keeps it expanding to more and more issue. Um, so to go back on your last question about the sirens, um, this, is, this has been a typical uh, way, at least in security literature, to frame uh, concerns about human security and responsibility to protect as being the sirens of you know, human security, right? So the, 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 the challenge that perhaps ASEAN, despite resisting these concepts as being you know, uh, liberal or pro-democratic concepts that don't necessarily align with uh, regional sensitivity is that there is a risk that if ASEAN was to adopt these concepts fully, that it could lead to some problems, right? And instead of embracing these sirens to do something else, to adopt a people-centered, you know, focus instead of a human security-centered focus. So this is where the, the, the the metaphor, at least on, on that chapter, was coming from, really. It's the, the idea that ASEAN chooses a different path, and one that is perhaps uh, recognizes that there is a, a, a commonality of security interests between the state and the people, instead of seeing them as opposite. Um, but also, we know that this is being, and this is part of what I, I discuss in the book, that this is challenged, right? That there is a, a pretty active network of peace activists in the region who organize across borders, who uh, are very active in initiatives like the ASEAN People's Forum, the ASEAN Civil Society Conference, who challenge that story and will say, no, actually, we need to embrace the sirens. And this is actually, these are not sirens. This is going to be good for the organization, and it needs to do so, right? So, um, but again, what I'm trying to do here is to map out how people in the region look at the security community. I'm not myself making an assessment uh, on, on whether or not ASEAN is or isn't a security a com a community according to, you know, whether it means the, the, the academic definition of dependable uh, expectations of peaceful change. Uh, what I was interested to do is to say, well, what does it mean in the 21st century in the context of Southeast Asia and ASEAN to have security? And the answer is, well, very different things. So yes, you're right. I'm complicating what uh, perhaps from a policymaker perspective is a much simpler story. Um, but this is, this is very much happening, right? And sometimes the, 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 the value added of academics is to complicate 
what appears to be a very simple story, but is actually much more complicated in practice, right? And the fact that there is these very different perspectives that, and where people play down the differences and say, oh, ultimately, you know, we, we all agree that security community is a desirable goal. Um, yes, but people mean very different things by that. And this impacts the kind of policy solutions that are going to come uh, from either ASEAN itself, but most likely from, from the ASEAN member states as well. I hope this answers at least some of your excellent questions, Professor Anwar. Thank you so much. Thank you. Is there any more questions from the floor? Um, yeah. Hello, good afternoon, Dr. Nata. Nice to see you. And thank you very much for bringing such a huge topics into very appealing uh, photographics and so on. Uh, my name is Nita, I'm the researcher from the Habibi Center, and I have very little knowledge about the regional security concern, but I'm interested in asking, you mentioned earlier about the entanglement between Indo-Pacific and also ASEAN in peacekeeping operations. And as the increasingly uh, congested space uh, that have very abundant uh, resource, valuable assets it's in terms of economics and also maritime uh, threat routes and so on. Uh, I think many other regions like European, European Union whose claiming interest and also the uh, stakes in the region has uh, such a concerns on the ASEAN and also in the Pacific uh, security threats. And my question is, uh, how optimistic are you uh, in seeing how other regions, uh, regional actors, and also international actors in supporting the functionalization of ASEAN and also in the Pacific structures to uh, manifest peace and security in the region. Thank you. Thank you. That's a very good question. Um, I think there is a momentum that perhaps wasn't there before. Uh, and a growing realization of how central this region is to world politics that was perhaps not quite there before. When it comes to particularly North America and Europe, uh, who like to think of themselves as the center of the world uh, and are increasingly coming to the realization that <laughs> this is no longer the case, practically. Um, I can speak from a Canadian perspective here as well, that there is this momentum, this realization of how important the region is and how important ASEAN is to uh, a broader kind of regional stability in the so-called Indo-Pacific that is going to benefit everyone. The challenge that I see is that while there is a realization, at least in the case of Canada, there is a, a challenge in actually committing material resources to support that realization. And so what we see, and not just in the case of Canada, is a proliferation of Indo-Pacific strategies uh, where, you know, there is, there is a, a recognition of, of ASEAN centrality as being very important. Um, hopefully that's going to mean, you know, some additional resources uh, for uh, diplomatic engagement in the region, some practical resources towards uh, security initiatives that align with how the region and various member states of ASEAN see their own security and see regional security. Um, but I think it comes with a challenge is that a lot of it, is, and again, I work on discourse, so I fully understand how uh, the, the, the performative aspects of this also matter. Um, but that, yeah, the challenge I see is the realization is there, uh, the interest is there, but then there is a little bit of a lag in terms of actual practical resource-based uh, commitments to support that realization. But I think that's overall also tied to challenges around just the funding of foreign policy and defense policy across the world and development policy across the world. So we see that, uh, you know, foreign aid and development uh, resources, uh, the budgets are being thinner and thinner and thinner. A lot of it transitions to private actors. I don't see this as a very 
productive, constructive trend uh, myself, to be perfectly honest. So, so this is where I think there is, there is a potentially a challenge moving forward in supporting that realization with actual resources. And that's certainly a challenge for Canada, for sure. Well, allow me to delve deeper into um, your response because I think I understand that you also mentioned that your work really focused on what is going on within ASEAN, but also um, if we're looking into the whole Indo-Pacific uh, construct, we can see that it is, in a sense, omnidirectional, as you mentioned, because in a sense we can see that not only this what's going on um, beyond in the Pacific affects what's going on within, but also what's within affects what's going on beyond ASEAN in the sense that both of the ASEAN and also extra regional powers who are interested in making references to ASEAN centrality, for example, are really um, talking to each other in that sense. So I was wondering how would you describe the discursive power of external powers in the sense, uh, given that um, with in the Pacific, for example, I think we're seeing a lot more interest in making references, whether it is um, rhetorical or, for example, maybe practical, uh, to us and centrality. So what would your sense to be um, uh, how, how influential has been discursive or input from external powers uh, within the region? What do you think? Yeah, and I think the, the discussion about the Indo-Pacific here is especially relevant. Um, and that goes back to this, the familiar scenario that I, I referenced uh, earlier. Um, ASEAN is very sensitive to its credibility to the outside world, right? So whenever there is um, a moment where, for good or bad reasons, I think there is a lot of misunderstanding of the added value of ASEAN from its dialogue partners just in general. So I want to make that clear. Um, but every time there is a moment where um, ASEAN's credibility is questioned, whether that has to do with Myanmar or that has to do with uh, its potential of acting as a, a go-between or provide a solution to the South China Sea disputes or um, to really tackle the core hard security issues. Every time there is deep frustration by the dialogue partners, ASEAN tries to resist a little bit, but ultimately it's always able to find a way to seize the initiative back and make some kind of reform, right? So you're right to point this out, that this is kind of a two-way street. Uh, and ASEAN is sensitive to the discursive power of, of its partners um, and will find a way to adapt and react in a way that is able to then convince dialogue partners that, hey, they still need to take ASEAN seriously and invest in strengthening its centrality or its role, right? And we've seen that with frustrations around the ASEAN Regional Forum that led to ultimately the expansion of the East Asia Summit, uh, the launch of ADMM Plus as, as ASEAN's response to what it saw and was very worried about uh, attacks on its credibility as an institution from dialogue partners. And so we see that happening with ASEAN's own response to the surge of concerns about Indo-Pacific and the various strategies, ASEAN came up with it reluctantly, I think you will agree, with its own outlook on the Indo-Pacific because it thought it had no choice than to kind of reluctantly embrace this shift of regional construct from the Asia-Pacific to the Indo-Pacific. The Indo-Pacific is perhaps unfortunately, it's not going away, right? And so ASEAN needed its own to seize back the initiative to propose its own response, and then it's going to keep building on this um, over the, the, the next couple of years to flesh out this outlook and what it can mean uh, practically. But that was, again, very much a similar scenario where ASEAN is very, very uh, uh, preoccupied by its image, and sometimes that can lead the organization to uh, launch itself and, and reform and change as a result of that. So, yeah, ASEAN has a lot of discursive power, and it's also, um, um, it cares a lot about the, 
the, the, the other side of the story, right? But that, that means it's going to lead to uh, some incremental, yes, but still significant changes in its approach over the, over the years. So we still have a few minutes for two to three more questions. Is there any more questions from the floor? Yeah. Okay, thank you. I'm Dito from Foreign Policy Community Indonesia. Thank you, Dr. Mustafa. But uh, I know so far I'm doing your book, but I haven't finished it yet. So, uh, if I'm not mistaken from your book, that you argue that ASEAN success as a security community is due in large part to its use of discourse. And however, you also acknowledge that ASEAN is a never ending story. And actually, that the security community status is constantly being challenged. Uh, so my question is, what are the limits of discourse in sustaining ASEAN security community status? And also, how can ASEAN overcome these limits and ensure the growth and stronger presence in the century for this discourse? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the very challenging questions. I hope I'm able to at least <laughs> offer the beginning of an answer. Um, so discourse is not everything, right, when it comes to, to uh, ASEAN security community enterprise. And I don't mean to suggest that uh, it's just discourse, as if it didn't matter, right? What I mean to suggest is that the way that ASEAN takes on the goal of becoming a security community and the way that it makes sense of what it means to form a security community by using certain words uh, to shape the endpoint matters. I think one challenge that ASEAN is experiencing uh, when it comes, and this is probably the limitations of the discourse, or, or discourse in general, is that uh, it seems that, particularly in the case of ASEAN, to keep the security community project always, because you can never actually reach security. This is an impossible goal, to have security. We'll never be 100% secure. There's always going to be something else to seek, right? It's, it's the nature of this very enterprise that is the pursuit of security. You can actually never reach it. So it's not a default of, of ASEAN to be a never-ending. Any pursuit of security is actually never-ending, okay? So just making that clear. But I think the, the, the limits of this as a driver of, of, of ASEAN is that what happens is that you always need to look for the next thing, right? So there is less emphasis, I think, on um, the more practical implementation strengthening of certain initiatives that ASEAN has adopted partly to justify its own existence, right? As any, any international organization would, right? NATO is doing the exact same thing. Uh, so it's not, again, like we need to situate any criticism on ASEAN against the backdrop of just criticism launched against every regional or international organization. Um, but what happens is that if you're always looking for the next thing, uh, you forget what you actually agreed to do, um, and you leave the implementation as if it was a second, second type of concern, right? So this is what um, I see as being perhaps the limitation of this. Uh, and I think you know the, the recent uh, adoption of a, of a regional action plan on women, peace, and security by ASEAN is a very good example of that. Um, so. You know, just a few years ago, there was not much on women, peace, and security in this part of the world for various reasons. And then within maybe five years, we have a number of declarations, we have a regional action plan, and then we're already thinking of moving to the next thing, which is youth, peace, and security. But the actual implementation of the broad principles um, that ASEAN has agreed to in that particular issue area um, maybe a lot of resources are going to be redirected to the next thing that we need to be talking about instead of actual implementation on the part of ASEAN member states. And we know that there is a lot of, again, variety of perspectives, 
on this uh, various levels of interest that actually doing something uh, concrete uh, to realize this agenda. But that's going to be papered over because we're going to focus on the next thing and the next thing and the next thing, right? And so this is where I see potentially the challenge for ASEAN um, to, to maybe worry less about what's going to be the next thing discursively to project that ASEAN is so good, it's doing so many things, it's taking up so many issues to actually do the less um, perhaps uh, uh, publicly uh, appealing job of actually really implementing its commitment uh, in, a, in a way that, that really helps solving the issues. Um, I think this might be the, the, the most important challenge. But this is, again, a challenge to some extent a bit unfair, um, you know, because we keep, and that's partly self-inflicted, I think, on the part of ASEAN, having all of these things that it commits to with so few uh, human and material resources dedicated to ASEAN in comparison to what other regional institutions with similar agendas would have and still struggle to implement, right? Um, so this is, this is the paradox or perhaps the, the way that discursive power in ASEAN is so strong is to say, well, you know, everybody looks at ASEAN and says, wow, this institution has committed to do so many things and in fact, it's quite extraordinary, the extent of the agenda. And at the same time, the actual manpower is so, so small, right, in contrast to other institutions. And that's too bad to some extent. But yeah, so that's, that's really the challenge. I don't think it, it's, it's anything that you don't know already. But thank you for the question. But I think that question especially rings true with how uh, the parting from the Shanghai dialogue, for example. I think clearly demonstrates how powerful like discourse is, given that how after following the dialogue, we can see a lot of discussions going on, uh, not only on, for example, Indonesia's, um, Indonesia's proposal for uh, the peace plan. Exactly. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> right, so Prabowo's, to make, uh, to make a clear, Prabowo's uh, peace plan in Ukraine, for example, and I think, um, it, it really highlights the importance of track two and track three dialogues um, in really propelling a lot of this discourse to really fly uh, in the region. And I think that's one of the important message of the book um, that uh, you mentioned quite a lot about the importance of track two and track three dialogue in not only promoting agendas, but also in making sure that these discussions uh, will not um, die just like that, for example. So I think that's one of the value that uh, you will um, see as you read through the book. Um, I think we still have time for one more question from the audience. Uh, okay, I think we will take one, uh, one and a half, three questions. So uh, we will take all the questions and uh, maybe you will answer all of those simultaneously. I will try. Hi, uh, my name is Son Yang. I'm from Korean Mission to ASEAN. I believe I've met you very briefly in uh, yeah, a long time it's ago. It's so good to see you when again. When you're doing your PhD thesis, I believe. So, uh, yeah, uh, very nice to see you. And uh, it's very interesting to see that the discourse analysis was, uh, uh, was adopted for your theme of the uh, book. I haven't had a chance to read a book, but um, I'll buy a book and have a look. So. Um, I believe some uh, discussions were made regarding the um, engagement between ASEAN and Dialogue Partner. And uh, I think I kind of agree uh, with you when you said about some Dialogue Partners are quite frustrated sometimes when we engage with ASEAN because I believe ASEAN is like quite vague or like um, gray sometimes, but then I think maybe that's their tactic or strength to engage with Dialogue Partner. Um, so my question is, um, do you see the discourse within ASEAN is different when they, in, uh, the discourse, for example, uh, no, uh, let me rephrase. So um, do you see ASEAN has different um, dynamic and discourse within ASEAN? And then uh, when they engage with dialogue partner, do you think they have different uh, image or discourse when they engage with uh, dialogue partners and depending on 
which dialogue partner they talk to. So that's my question. Of course, this is the short answer. Uh, and I remember our conversation, and thank you so much for being here. It's lovely to see you again. Um, actually, I will say that this is a topic that I addressed in uh, recently published peer-reviewed articles that are not quite uh, part of this book project, but still part of a, a later collaboration. And I'm happy to send you a copy if you want to. Um, Part of ASEAN's power, and this is what I discuss in, this, in, in these articles, is its ability to mystify its dialogue partners sometimes. So that, you know, sometimes dialogue partners will come out of a particular meeting and even members of the same delegation will say, oh, I think that was a yes. And others will say, no, I don't think, and, no, but they welcomed it. Yeah, but, you know, this is not. <laughs> So that happens quite a, quite a lot, and I think it's less the matter of uh, which dialogue partner as a whole you talk to, but also the experience of particular diplomats in uh, reading through the codes, basically, that ASEAN uses to, to refer to, to how welcoming it is to, to certain initiatives, right? Um, and I think it's quite apparent, uh, and, and uh, there's one chapter in the book that goes through, again, these various moments in the scenario I was referring to. So when Kevin Rudd came with this Asia-Pacific Community Initiative and how you know, <laughs> it, it flopped. Um, but you know, it, it took a while, I think, for people to actually realize how resistant uh, ASEAN's uh, res response was to the initiative, right? Because you know, I think they, you know, the fact that ASEAN takes note of something, as you well know, is, is you know, oof. <laughs> that's very bad, right? Um, so I think, you know, as, as, di as, as diplomats uh, who are posted in, in ASEAN come to learn more about the organization, they're going to be more familiar with, with perhaps how to navigate this, and, um, or at least how to figure out what they don't know. Right? And it's true that ASEAN has become very good uh, since it, it, it was created, and, but the, also in the, <coughs> when the di the, since the dialogue partner um, relations with, with, were put into place to make sure that uh, intra-ASEAN divisions do not necessarily appear as clearly out in the open. I think the organization has, been str has struggled with that over recent years for sure. Um, but it's still very, very um, uh, typical that dialogue partners will not necessarily know which particular ASEAN member state is resisting a particular initiative. And you guys spend so much time trying to figure that out with much more help sometimes from ASEAN. But I think this speaks to the power of ASEAN that if they don't want something to happen, oof, it's going to be very tough <laughs> for you to make something happen. But that's also, it requires a lot of, of work and energy on the part of ASEAN itself to resist something that it doesn't want to see happening, right? So sometimes we, we, we have this view of ASEAN as being this kind of passive actor, or we tend to see the fact that not much is happening as just, you know, but that actually requires a lot of work and diplomatic skill, right? And that deserves more attention. Um, but yeah, the power to mystify and the power to resist initiatives that ASEAN doesn't want to see or particular uh, ASEAN member states don't want to see, that requires a lot of diplomatic work and savviness. Um, and I think dialogue partner diplomats come to respect that uh, uh, typically, you know, that time and time. So typically they will arrive and they will say, you know, and some people have said, and I don't know that it was you, but some people will say, you know, ASEAN, like, this is insane. Like, nothing, like, it's not, how can it work? And then a few months in, you will actually come to see, and I can certainly say that, that Canadian diplomats who've, who've, uh, who, whom I've talked to <clears throat> have very much come to this realization that, oh, wow, like, no, actually, there's such skill here, and we need to actually respect that work uh, quite a bit more. And it's not, you know, the, the, the fact that it doesn't mean our expectation 
or expectation of how diplomacy ought to be conducted according to some standard in the West about, you know, a, a more confrontational style of diplomacy or, you know, we'll come to a meeting and we'll have results immediately without any prior consultation. Uh, at some point, you know, yeah, the diplomats come to learn how to do things and how to do their work differently by being exposed uh, to ASEAN diplomacy. And I think by the end of it, they become much more admirative uh, than they would have been just uh, when they arrived, right? So the, the learning, I guess, goes both ways, but there's a lot that, that non-ASEAN diplomats learn just by, by being here and interacting with ASEAN diplomats. Yeah, thank you for your question. Hi, good evening. Let me just uh, start, if I may, but I'm glad. Human peace and security is something that Canada and Korea can come together with ASEAN. My name is Nindy. I'm from the Mission of Canada to ASEAN. Um, I'm just going to ask a question that don't reflect my employer's view, but I'm just going to put my academic hat, I guess. It got me at um, ASEAN cares about its credibility towards external partners. And a spark question for me, uh, where is the place for membership enlargement especially. I know that we're expecting Timor Leste to come as a member state, but um, what more can we expect from that? Thank you. You mean in terms of further expansion of ASEAN? Like to more members afterwards? or I don't know how to answer this question. I mean, part of the I don't know comes from how long it took ASEAN, right, to actually agree, and for good reason. I mean, ASEAN knows very well the risks uh, of expanding too fast to new members or the, the kind of challenges that it can create and the kind of strain that this can have on the ability of the organization to actually agree on stuff. And I think ASEAN has become more and more worried about uh, the challenge of speaking with one voice on, on particular issues when you have so many different perspectives from, from ASEAN member states on certain issues. And I think clearly this is a huge issue when it comes to handling Myanmar right now. Because there's, there's no consensus within the ASEAN membership on how long the Myanmar generals ought to be excluded from ASEAN meetings, which ASEAN meetings. Uh, I think this is on the back of people in Indonesia in particular uh, when it comes to gradually, you know, gearing for a transition of the chairmanship to Laos in particular and what will that mean uh, in, in, in terms of upholding that, that principle that has been, you know, <clears throat> I think, you know, again, there's so many challenges and the, there's, there's a limited uh, number of things that ASEAN can actually do, but this, this exclusion of the generals of, of ASEAN, of key ASEAN meetings is the one thing I think that, you know, um, but whether it's going to be the case uh, and up, up until when is, 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 you know, a pretty important question. So again, and that comes from the fact that a number of ASEAN member states are actually working on their own to undermine that, that commitment, right? So this is a huge issue. Um, I don't think we can expect that from Timor Leste necessarily. This is not what I'm saying. But I think there is a weariness about expanding Well, you know, at first when ASEAN was created, Sri Lanka was almost part of it, right? So who knows? Uh, you know, Papua New Guinea could be the next. I don't know. So I, I, I won't go there. I think we still, we, we still need to see Tim Oleste coming in, and then we'll talk about what comes next. Um, but, but I think it's especially relevant for Canada as well to understand, right? So the fact that there is resistance to uh, allowing more dialogue partners to accede to these coveted uh, meetings, the East Asia Summit, ADMM Plus, is also a wariness on the part of ASEAN that sometimes ASEAN centrality can only mean strength in numbers, right? The fact that there are the ASEAN 10 and soon to be 11, there's still more in numbers than the non-ASEAN 
you know, actors at the table, and that's that's a pretty big concern, uh, and it's the driver of the resistance to uh, having other members, other non-ASEAN members, accede to this these particular forum, um, because there is a fear that ASEAN's influence is going to be further diluted, right? So I think the two are actually tied, right? The expansion of ASEAN's membership itself is tied to the expansion of ASEAN-centric uh, fora to non-ASEAN members, uh, and I think this is this has been a part of the issue for Canada, uh, particularly uh, when it comes to securing it. On top of you know Canada struggling to uh, make a good case for itself that it is more than a poor cousin to Australia or a mini US, right? And unfortunately, I can say that I'm again academic. <laughs> I'm not paid by the Canadian government. Uh, but this remains a challenge, definitely, for Canada. But I think it's tied to how ASEAN sees itself in terms of consolidating its membership, how many members, and therefore how many seats, non-ASEAN seats, can be offered at these tables. Right. Great, thank you. And that nicely concludes our discussion for today. So thank you very much for everyone tuning in for YouTube and also joining us physically in our office today. Uh, and I think I really recommend reading the book, by the way, because I read the book from cover to cover, and it's really interesting to follow through all of the three stories that uh, Dr. Martel explained before. So I think that also allows us to really appreciate what's going on behind ASEAN, and not just looking at it from the practical sense, but also understanding it from uh, a more discurs uh, discursive approach. So thank you, everyone, and see you on the next public lecture. Thank you.